Our Lord is patiently waiting for the worship. You know, God loves worship. We love worship. We love to worship our God, don't we? Amen. We have a few announcements to lift up today. My name is Donna Boardman. I'm the lay leader of this congregation, and this is Pastor Kevin Drain, who will be leading us today in worship. We have a special noisy offering today for the Senior Center. So be sure on your way out at the exits to look for the little buckets. Those are where the donations go for Senior Center. And we thank you for that. We have, uh, you know, God gives us abilities and talents and all kinds of gifts. And some of those sometimes are music. So for those of you who are musical and you enjoy music, you want to take part in music, we have lots of opportunities coming up this fall. The Children's Choir and the Children's Bell Choir rehearsals will begin on Tuesday, August 20th. That's just this week. 5.15 p.m. is the choir. They'll be rehearsing until 5.30, and the bells will rehearse 5.45 to 6.15. So please talk to Katie Anderson if you're interested in that for the children. Also, we have um, the adult sanctuary choir rehearsals will begin at the end of this month, August 29th, and the bell choir rehearsals right after that, September 5th. So make sure you mark your calendars to pencil that in. On August 25th, our um, church will be hosting a blessing of the backpacks, which is a special prayer time for the children's backpacks. We're asking that all of the children and all of the grandparents who have grandchildren bring your children and your backpacks in so that we can bless them for the school year at this special time during our worship service. We're also having a big back-to-school bash. You'll find a um, flyer in your bulletin. Please make sure that you read that. It's very important. We're inviting the community to come in and enjoy this time. It's going to be a carnival. We're going to have all kinds of games and fun things to do, activities and petting zoo and a bounce house and obstacle course and <laughs> you name it, it's on here. So it sounds like a lot of fun to me. And of course, to do this, we need a lot of volunteers. So if you have not volunteered already, and you have a moment that you can help, we would really appreciate volunteers to help. We're also looking still for donations, I believe. And we are asking that you pre-register the children prior to August 22nd so that we can have a head count. We also are looking for volunteers to help with the uh, Hog Day Parade, which will be coming up before we know it. Can you believe it? It's almost Hog Days. And so, we're looking for walkers and also those who would like to ride on the float and work on the float. So please contact the church office if you would like to take part in that. And one thing, uh, we apologize, our bulletin is a little bit off. The mission team is not going to be meeting this coming Monday. They will be meeting at 5.30 the next Monday, May 26th, I believe is what that day is. Or excuse me, August. <laughs> you missed it if it was in May. <laughs> All right, so uh, are there any other announcements this morning? Oh, and the prayer vigil. We have a third service coming up. We're really praying hard that this is going to be a success. God is with us. Are you with us? We hope so. Yes. And we invite everyone to come and join us for this. There's going to be more information coming, but today after worship there will be a prayer vigil for that. And so we ask that you hang out and join us for that so that we can get all the prayers in that we can. God bless you all. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Don. That's kind of loud. How are you all? I'm upstairs today, guys. Look around. Where's he at? Good news. Every two weeks I get good news. What is going on September 8th? Anybody know? September 8th at 11 o'clock, what's going on? We are going to awaken. So, just so you all understand, that's September 8th. Mark Washburn is sitting right down below me here. If you are musically inclined, get a hold of Mark. They're doing well. Rehearsal is tomorrow night at 7 p.m., correct, Mark? Wednesday night. Just checking to see, Kevin, one of your employees. Very good. So you all are on top of it better than I am. One of the things that is going to be uh, kind of important on this first one it is an awakening, but we're also going to have 11 o'clock refreshments. So coffee, 
come awake ahead of the good service. But September 8th, it's going to be cool. And like I say, those of you watching on YouTube, you'll catch it eventually on YouTube. But come join us, everybody. Bring your friends. It'll be an after-school bash after uh, Labor Day. So uh, show up September 8th. Amen. Have any questions, call the church. So if you didn't catch that, 11 to 11.30 is what we call perk up time. Yeah. For coffee, get it, perk up. <laughs> you guys are missing an opportunity for preaching here. Perk up time, 11 to 11.30, and then the worship itself will start at 11.30 and run until approximately 12.30. That's September 8th. Thanks, Bill. We appreciate it. Uh, also, I'm going to reiterate an announcement Don already made. If you show up for missions, team meeting tomorrow night, enjoy the meeting. We're going to be showing up the following week on the 26th. So, excellent. Um, come help us with uh, Back to School Bash. And we are looking for singers or musicians on Wednesday evening. Uh, they will practice in the fellowship hall. 7 o'clock on Wednesday. So if you have, uh, or if you are musically inclined, or think you are, come on down. Come on down. Let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. Your hymnal? Or 801. 801? 801. Psalm number 80 is our psalter reading today. We'll be reading verses 1 through 7. If you would, rise, rise in spirit, at least with us. Psalm 80, verses 1 through 7. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. You who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth in the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. We store us, us, O God. God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved.
thank you. Please be seated. We have an opportunity to continue our worship as we go to God in prayer. As usual, we will, at the conclusion of our prayer time, recite together the Lord's Prayer. It's number 895 in your hymnal. It's also in your bulletin. Today, we'll stitch together several prayers from Grace Cathedral, followed by an adaptation of the 31st Psalm. But first, we'll begin with a prayer written by John D. Rayner. Let us pray. Our Lord and Almighty God, when evil darkens our world, give us light. When despair numbs our souls, give us hope. And when we stumble and fall, lift us up. When doubts assail us, give us faith. And when nothing seems sure, give us trust. When ideals fade, give us vision. When we lose our way, be our guide. That we may find serenity in your presence and purpose in doing your will. In you, O Lord, we take refuge. Let us never be put to shame. Deliver us in your righteousness. Turn your ear to us. Come quickly to our rescue. Be our rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save us. Since you are our rock and our fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide us. Keep us free from the trap that is set for your people. For you are our refuge. Into your hands we commit our spirit. Deliver us, Lord, our faithful God. We despise those who cling to worthless idols. As for us, we trust in the Lord. We will be glad and rejoice in your love. For you saw our affliction and knew the anguish of our souls. You have not given us into the hands of the enemy, but have set our feet in a spacious place. Be merciful to us, O Lord, for we are in distress. Our eyes grow weak with sorrow, our soul and body with grief. Our lives are consumed by anguish. And our years by groaning. Our strength fails because of our afflictions. And sometimes our bones grow weak. Lord, on this day, we, we pray for those who are sick. God of all comfort, our very present help in trouble, be near us. Look on us with the eyes of your mercy. Comfort us with a sense of your presence. Preserve us from the enemy and give us patience in our affliction. Restore us to health and lead us to your eternal glory through Christ Jesus our Lord. For those who struggle emotionally or mentally, we pray. Blessed Jesus, in the comfort of your love, we lay before you the memories or thoughts that haunt us, the anxieties that perplex us, the despair or depression that frightens us, and our frustration at our inability to sometimes think clearly. Help us to discover your forgiveness in our memories and know your peace in our time of distress. Touch us, O Lord, and fill us with your light, your spirit, your hope. And we pray for our protection and protection for our community. Jesus the Christ, you are light of light. You are brightness indescribable. The wisdom, the power and glory of God, the word made flesh. You overcame the forces of Satan, redeemed the world, and then ascended again to the Father. Grant us, we pray, that in this tarnished world, 
we may exhibit the shining of your splendor. Send your archangel Michael to defend us, to guard our going out and our coming in, and to bring us safely to your presence where you reign the Holy Trinity forever and ever. In Jesus' name, Lord, hear our prayers. And now together we lift up the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Our special music today will be a piano and organ duet with uh, our organist Teresa Yarger, our pianist Katie Anderson. said, do you feel blessed? Amen. Amen. You know, we're all blessed. We're all blessed. God gives each and every one of us at least one gift, one talent for us to share with the kingdom, for us to share in the body of Christ. And we should do that. I truly, truly believe that. Maybe music isn't your talent, but God has given you something to use for the church and for our community. God blesses us indeed. We have an opportunity now to continue our worship as we bring our tithe to the storehouse. 
That action and our attitude is an act of worshiping our God. Let us worship our God as we give.
Our Lord and our God, once again, we humbly approach your altar, recognizing that everything good we have, we owe to you, God. Thank you for the way you pour out your grace and your love and your mercy. Thank you for the talents that you have shared with us. You bless us indeed. Our prayer is always for wisdom and discernment, so that we might use this offering not for our glory, but so the world would know the glory of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Please turn to hymn number 525, or understand it better by and by. understand why pastor picked that song it's a good song now don't you think yeah we'll sing it a few more times and maybe we'll uh, get better at it or maybe i was the only one struggling i don't know come on Dave.
Good morning. Our scripture this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 5 through 25. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had lain down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. David then asked Elimelech the Hittite and Abshai, son of Zariah, Joab's brother, Who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul, lying asleep inside the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head, and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head, and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping, because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away. There was a wide space between them. He called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner. Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied. Who are you who calls to the king? David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your lord the king? Someone came to destroy your lord and the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men deserve to die, because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, my lord the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done, and what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my lord the king listen to his servant's words. If the lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, men have done it, may they be cursed before the lord. They have now driven me from my share in the lord's inheritance and have said, Go, serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. Because you considered my life precious today, I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way, and Saul returned home. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Linda. Everybody having a good day? Everybody having a good day? Yes. Do you feel blessed? Yes. You know, so this is ironic in that, you know, normally I'm one of those guys that if the sun's shining, it's a really good day, right? But this year it seems like if it's overcast, I'm like, yes, this might be the day, (laughs) right? This might be the day. We're going to get a big rain. I know it's coming. Isn't it odd how... Whether the sun's shining or now that it's overcast, I suddenly have a a new appreciation for God's wonder and God's creation. And you know what? That's, I think, what God wants, where he wants us to be. That we can feel blessed and feel his joy and his peace, regardless of what's going on around us or what's going on in our life as well. Don't you agree? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was truly excited to see overcast skies today. Yeah, I know, I'm not right, but... You know, in God's Word, He tells us 
that we should forgive. Matthew 11 verse 25 says this, When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Now, I've said it before, you know, every time we recite together the Lord's Prayer, well, that can be the most awesome thing. But on the other hand, there's a couple of thoughts in there that could trip us up if we're not careful. I mean, think about this. We recite and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, truthfully, are we saying, God, uh, I'm forgiving, so thank you for forgiving me? Or are we saying, God, I'm not very forgiving, so therefore you don't have to forgive me? How many of you are looking for that second one? Most of us aren't. And yet, truthfully, that's what it says. Forgive us as we forgive others. And so sometimes I think we may just be reciting a prayer and not thinking about what it says. God calls us to forgive. In fact, He doesn't call us. He doesn't ask us to forgive. If you read God's Word, He commands us to forgive. He doesn't say it'd be a good idea. He doesn't say you may want to consider it. God commands us to be forgiving people. So, I don't know about you, but I need a lot of forgiveness. Anyone else? Yeah. So, I need to be forgiving, don't I? And that's always easy, right? Not so much. Not so much. In May of 1987, 39 American seamen were killed in the Persian Gulf when an Iraqi pilot hit their ship, the USS Stark, with a missile. Newspapers carried a picture of the son of one of these seamen, a shy five-year-old boy named John Kaiser. The picture showed him with his hand over his heart as a flag-draped coffin was loaded onto a plane. His mother said, I don't have to mourn or wear black because I know my husband is in heaven. That's an awesome thing, isn't it? She was confident of her husband and where he was at with the Lord. She went on to say, I am happy because I know he is better off. And get this, later on, she and her young son, John, sent a letter and an Arabic New Testament to the pilot of the Iraqi plane. It was addressed to the man who attacked the Stark, my dad's ship. Can you imagine? They were hoping that it would show that even the son and wife do not hold any grudge and that at the same time they are praying for the one who took the life of his father. I don't know if I have that kind of faith. Do you? It's crazy, isn't it? What a sad story. And yet how inspiring as well. In that forgiveness, which is a basic tenet within our faith, was flowing from that wife and that son toward that pilot. I'm not sure all the ramifications of 39 dead seamen. I doubt that everyone who lost a dad, a father, a wife, a brother, a sister, a friend, in that attack was quite as forgiving. I don't know if I could have been so forgiving. But I do know this. I know that God calls us as Christians 
to be forgiving people. No, he commands us. The God who loves us, the God we say we love, says don't just be forgiving when you feel forgiving, but just be forgiving. Right? So often I think we want to wait until we feel forgiving, but God didn't say when you feel forgiving, be forgiving. He didn't say when you feel loving, be loving. Be forgiving. Be loving. Well, let's see what God's communicating via today's scripture. 1 Samuel 26, beginning in verse 5. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had laid down. Now, Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. And David then asked Ahimelech, there were a few names in here today. Aren't you glad you weren't reading, right? So David then asked Ahimelech, a Hittite, and Abishi, Abishi, the son of Zeruiah. Zeruiah, yes, I said it. Joab's brother. Who will go down into the camp with me? To Saul. I'll go with you, said Abishi. So David and Abishi went to the army by night. And there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. They were trying to create a a physical barrier so people couldn't get to King Saul. Abishi, verse 8, Abishi said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. Abishi is saying, This is the guy who pursues you, David. Who wants to take your life. We have an unbelievable opportunity right here in front of us. But we learned a week ago, as we had a story about a woman named, anybody remember? Abigail. Abigail, remember that story? Abigail who went to David and begged him not to kill her husband. Okay? David learned a lesson there. David needed to let God take care of his enemies. That was the lesson Abigail taught him. You don't want my husband's blood on your hands. And David was coachable. He was teachable. And so now today, he's taking some of those same issues and putting them into practice. So in verse 9, but David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's ordained. That I should lay a hand on the Lord's ordained. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come. He will die or go into battle and perish. Verse 12. So David took the spear and the water jug near Saul's head and they left. And no one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone awake. They are all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Do you understand what's going on? All of a sudden, David is trying to have a teaching moment with Abishai. 
It says, 13, David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away. And there was a wide space between them. And he called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Now he's going to give him a hard time. And Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Abner was a, a mighty warrior. Who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your Lord the King? Someone came to destroy your Lord the King. What, have you, what you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men deserve to die because you did not guard your Master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and the water jug that were near his head? Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? Interesting way to address David, don't you think? All of a sudden, now he's using some awfully personal or intimate language. All of a sudden, my son, right? Because David had an opportunity to kill him and didn't take it. David replies, yes, it is, my lord, the king. He didn't say my father, did he? My beloved, he didn't say anything like that. He said, my lord and my king. And he added, why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? What, am I, what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my Lord the King listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, men have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have now driven me from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, Go serve other gods. Do not let my blood fall on the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. David is saying, What is the deal? Who am I? I'm virtually nothing. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Here is the king's spear, David answered. You understand? Here is the king saying, Oh, David, I forgive you and, and I'm going to be good now. I'm going to be okay now. Now you should just allow us to reconcile. And David's answer is, here's your spear. That's why you're here. You're here to kill me. Here's your spear, David. You see, it's possible that we forgive someone but we don't necessarily have to reconcile. God commands us to forgive. He does not command us to reconcile. We think in our Christianness that forgive and forget. And God forgives and forgets. Thanks be to God. But he gave us a mind. A mind that locks all our experiences in. Sometimes we wonder about that, don't we? But the reality is that God calls us to forgive. He may or may not call us to reconcile. There are conditions that need to be met. So here's David and Saul saying, well, reconcile with me then. Let's get together here. David had taken the righteous road, the high road, we might say. 
He will not kill the Lord's anointed, King Saul. It's not going to do it. David knows that God is righteous, and at one time God anointed Saul, and, and therefore he became God's man. He was the anointed. And David showed his faith in God when he stated, I will not strike the life of the Lord's anointed. What a learning experience this must have been for Abishai. Here he is telling David that I can end your troubles right now if you'll just give me permission. David's response had to be a faith-building moment for Abishai, I would think. And it should be the same for us, that it should be a faith-building moment for us as well. David tells him, think about it, Abishai. God anointed that man, and whoever kills him will not be pleasing to God. In fact, God will deal with that person. Would David... Well, David's attitude was, I'm in God's hands. I don't need to take his life. God has me. He had already told him that God would deal with King Saul. You know, that's a pretty huge faith, don't you think? That's a massive faith. David was human. I, I, I love to, to think and meditate about King David because he was so human. He struggled. He had lots of struggles. And yet, God's Word says he was a man after God's own heart. I think this is one of those places where he was a man after God's own heart. Well, most of us probably are not going to have to deal with enemies that literally want to take our life. That's a blessing, don't you think? Thank you. Those of you who are still awake. It's interesting to think about enemies. Our friends love us in spite of our faults, but an enemy loves or hates us in spite of our virtues. Our friends love us in spite of our faults. An enemy hates us in spite of our, our virtues, the good things in our life. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow put it this way, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we would find that in each man's life there is sorrow and enough suffering to disarm our hostility. The subject of forgiveness, fascinating stuff. Most of us hopefully will never know enemies who want to take our life no, we get enemies when, well, I can never beat her in that pie contest at the fair. Or, that guy is so much stronger than I am. Or, I mean, fill in the blank. We, in our humanness, we get so envious. And suddenly, friction, and we have enemies. David had an enemy who wanted to take his life. We have enemies when we're envious of their position in life. Matthew 5, 21. Do not murder. You know, Jesus is saying, you've heard it said, right? Do not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Verse 22. But I tell you, this is Jesus, that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Oftentimes I think we think that Jesus came and he gave us this get out of jail free card. But the reality is if you read the Bible, oftentimes what Jesus had to say was more stringent than what Mosaic law was. Mosaic law said you shouldn't kill another human being. And Jesus came and said if you're angry, then you've already sinned. And we need to remember that. We're supposed to be forgiving. And yet, our, our human nature, we remember phrases like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You got that one down. 
We all do, don't we? Because if someone wrongs us, then we've got to get even. Right? We all become accountants and want to balance the sheet at that point in time. But that's not what God said. God says, be forgiving. Not necessarily be forgiving when you feel forgiving, because sometimes we don't feel so forgiving. I have people that I counsel sometimes, and they look at me when I tell them that, you know, you need to forgive that individual. You'd think I'd hit them upside the head with a two before. Because they look at me and they say, but pastor, God knows in my heart I don't feel forgiving. And he'll know I'm a hypocrite. And I said, well, welcome to the rest of us hypocrites. Right? The reality is this. And what I tell them is, why not try praying like this? And and, Lord, you know, and folks, I hope you know, that I'm not telling you I do everything right. I don't. But here's an interesting way to pray if you find yourself in that position. God, you know my heart. And you know I don't feel very forgiving toward this individual. But I love you, Lord. And because I love you, I'm praying that I forgive this man, this woman, whoever it may be. And my hope and prayer, Lord, is that someday you allow my feelings to catch up with my actions. And you know what? Here's the irony to all this. The more you pray for that enemy, the more those negative feelings will go away. See, I think that's God's economy. You can't be a blessing to someone else without being blessed yourself. And so don't worry about whether you think God thinks you're a hypocrite i got news for you. He knows we all are, right? I mean, that's the sad reality. We all are. Maybe that's not our goal every morning when we wake up, but we all are. In the Civil War, after it had ended, there were a lot of evil or opportunistic and unscrupulous people. That's where the term carpetbagger came from, right? All those northerners headed down south trying to take advantage after they had lost the Civil War. There was a group of die-hard southerners that gained a meeting with President Abraham Lincoln while meeting with the president. His gentle and friendly nature kind of seemed to thaw the iciness in the room. And before it was all over, the Southerners left with a new appreciation, a new respect for this old foe, Abraham Lincoln. But afterward, a Northern congressman approached the president and he criticized him for befriending the enemy, suggesting that instead of befriending them, he should have had them shot for the traitors that they were. That would have dealt with our enemies. And Lincoln just looked at this congressman and and smiled and replied, am I not destroying my enemies by making them my friends? Wow. That's an important thought, isn't it? Am I not destroying my enemies as I make them my friends? See, the real issue here today isn't what we do as human beings. We're all human. We all struggle with it. An eye for an eye, and I have to get even. And we know we've all felt that at some point in time. The question, though, is what will you do? What will you do when you're in that circumstance? Can you take the high road like David did? Will you take the high road? Or will you say, it's okay, God, I got this. I'm not going to worry about what your punishment is. I'll take care of that for you, Lord. It happens. Just remember, God doesn't say forgive when you feel forgiving. He commands us to be forgiving. So here's your answer. Final statement. Twice. The answer is for us to pray to the Holy Spirit. 
that we'll be able to fulfill God's desires in our lives. Did you hear that? The answer is for us to pray to the Holy Spirit that we will be able to fulfill God's desires for our life. Good praying. Amen. Our hymn ascending is number 535 of 534, Be Still My Soul. Please stand as you're able and join in singing. Jesus Christ, His holy and perfect Son, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, may we leave this place and go be the light, be the life of Christ. Go in peace, go in love. Amen and amen.